Well, once again, brethren, as we come to engage mind and heart on this vast and vital subject, let's cast ourselves afresh upon the Lord and His grace and plead for His help. Let's pray together. Holy Father, we own once more our total dependence upon you, the God who gives us life and breath and all things, you, the God who keeps all of the molecules and all of the chemistry of our brain functioning normally that we may hear and process words and understand concepts and we pray that you, the God who in infinite wisdom and almighty power has designed and made us and continually sustains us, that you will now be our portion, enabling me to speak as I ought, enabling each man to hear as he ought, and that we together will be conscious of your presence and the ministry of the Holy Spirit instructing us out of the word. So give us every needed grace that we may conclude this hour and with unfeigned thankfulness praise you that once more you have proven yourself to be the God who hears and who answers prayer. Hear us for the sake of your beloved Son in whose name alone we draw near to you. Amen. 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 Well, in the previous hour, brethren, I attempted to set before you a working definition of pastoral counseling. I then highlighted a very vital distinction, and then I answered an obvious question and concluded my introduction with an explanation of the actual contents of this series of lectures. We then began to take up unit one of an overview of pastoral counseling. And we had time only to address the necessity for pastoral counseling and the proper place for pastoral counseling amid the manifold responsibilities of fulfilling your role as a shepherd of God's people. We now continue the overview by addressing in the third place what I've chosen to call the framework or the ideal setting for pastoral counseling. First of all, the general spiritual setting and then just a few brief words about the specific physical setting. First of all, then, the general spiritual setting. Under normal circumstances, the setting should be one in which you are counseling someone who is a member in your assembly committed to you as their God-appointed shepherd or one of their God-appointed shepherds and someone who is not only committed to you in that sheep-shepherd relationship voluntarily entered upon but someone involved in the total life and ministry of the church in which you labor. According to Ephesians 2, 4, 12 to 16, the spiritual maturation of each individual within the body of Christ is envisioned as being realized in deep, multi-level interaction with the other members of the body as well as intimate personal interaction with the pastor teachers given by Christ to that body. Granted, there may be some situations where your counseling may be part of a broader evangelistic opportunity and endeavor. However, as a general rule, the spiritual setting ought to be one in which you, as a God-appointed shepherd, are interacting with one of the sheep who has previously voluntarily committed himself to your spiritual oversight and care. And it is with respect to this matter 
that J. Adams did break new ground and broke it with a very broad and strong shovel. And he wrote saying, to say the Christian minister is counselor and preacher par excellence means that he is called to these works as his function or office in the church. It does not exclude much teaching, exhortation, and counseling on the part of every Christian incidental to his particular gifts and calling, all of which raises the important matter of whether Christians may legitimately assume the position of counselors as a life task and calling apart from ordination to the Christian ministry. Just as all Christians may give witness to their faith, which involves an informal proclamation of the word, and he cites Acts 8, 1 to 4, the whole church announcing the message of good news, so all Christians may indeed must do counseling. Yet not all Christians have been solemnly set aside to the work of nuthetically confronting every man and teaching every man as the Christian minister is. He, in a special way, has been appointed and set aside by God and the church to these two works of ministry by the call of God and the church and the laying on of hands. There is no indication in the scriptures that anyone but those who have been so recognized should undertake the work of counseling or proclamation of the word officially, that is, as an office, work, or life calling. This means that the persons with a life calling to do counseling ought to prepare for the work of the ministry and seek ordination since God describes a life calling to counseling as the life calling of a ministry. And he goes on to say, the authority of Christ given to those who have the rule, Hebrews 13, 7, 17, 1 Thessalonians 5, 13, must not be despised. The unordained Christian counselor working outside the organized church of Christ has not received and cannot exercise such authority. Yet this authority in many ways is of great importance in the work of counseling. And in addition, he must recognize, reckon with the fact that in going it alone, he has failed to bring himself under the authority of Christ vested in his church. All would-be Christian counselors should consider and take seriously their own gifts and callings. And Dr. Adams, I believe, has underscored very accurately. There were a few words in that quote that I would change, but the substance of it I heartily endorse without any reservations. Secondly, I now want to say a few words concerning the specific physical setting. If the general spiritual setting is a shepherd with one of his sheep, then what about the physical setting? The time is coming for your appointment, for someone to come and to be counseled in your office, in your study. Perhaps you're going to meet them in their home. What should mark that physical setting? We are not disembodied spirits. We are affected by our physical surroundings and environment. And I suggest three simple things. That setting should be marked, first of all, by its propriety. And I'm thinking here of two texts of Scripture out of the book of Romans. First of all, Romans chapter 13 and verse 14. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. I need not recite what you well know that it is out of the matrix of one-on-one personal pastoral calling that many a sordid affair 
has blossomed. That's just a fact. And part of it is this verse has been ignored. A setting for the counseling session was arranged that made flirtation, eventual touching, embracing, leading to actual sexual intercourse because it was carried on in a setting that was not marked by propriety. And then the second text, and I will be a bit more specific in applying this matter, is Romans 14 and verse 16. Let not your good be evil spoken of. Don't allow a situation to emerge where there'd be any legitimate grounds to question your motives or your actions in a counseling session. Then secondly, the setting ought to be marked by compatibility. In other words, it should be compatible to what you're there to do. And this compatibility may involve a number of factors concerning which God will help you to cultivate a growing awareness of the things that will help the person you are counseling feel secure when engaged in counseling with you. You make practical applications of the golden rule again, as you would that others do unto you, even so do ye also unto them. We're talking now about such things as if you're going to visit a couple in the home and they have little ones, think ahead, discuss with the couple, and what plans do you have for the care of your little ones that we can have a completely undistracted, undisturbed time together. Think ahead of the situation into which you are going. Likewise, with respect to your situation. Think ahead. Do you want the telephone ringing in the midst of a counseling session in your study? Well, then turn the phone off, throw it out the window, do whatever you've got to do. I had to get some new phones. And the problem is, I can turn off the base that holds the portable phone in it so it doesn't ring, but I can't turn off the phone. It has no button to push. I have to let it ring, and then I can push a button that shuts it up until the next call comes through. That greatly troubles me. My old phone, I could turn off the ringer, and then the answering service, there was a separate unit, completely turn it off, and nothing was more disturbing than in the critical place in a counseling session. Thankfully, most of the sessions recently have been with preachers, and I just tell them ahead of time, brother, I don't know how to turn that stinking hand phone off, and if it rings, I'll get up off my seat and push a button that will shut it up, even though I can't uh, turn it off. So consider the matters then of propriety, and then this second concern that I've identified with the word compatibility. Is the setting compatible to what I'm there to do? And then the third place, it ought to involve a judicious setting of privacy. Here again, the pressure of Matthew 7, 12 should be upon your conscience as a pastor. However, the pursuit of privacy must not negate the element of propriety. And in the light of this, one of the things we did in this building any time a pastor is going to have a room assigned as his study or office, the pastoral office. One of the first things the deacons do is they make sure that into those solid oak doors goes a window. So anyone at any time can look in and see that there's no hanky-panky going on behind those doors when the preacher, the pastor, the elder is sitting with one of the sheep. And so... Just those brief words then about the setting from the spiritual standpoint. It should be a strictly ecclesiastical framework of recognized sheep and shepherd relationship. Physically, it ought to be marked by these three things. Now then, in the fourth place, as we continue this overview, we will now direct our attention to that which I'm designating as the goals of pastoral counseling. When you've set a time to meet with one of the sheep 
or with a couple, what are you doing as you move into that session? Well, let me suggest we ought to think in terms of a proximate goal and then an ultimate goal. The proximate goal should be, as you welcome one of the sheep to your study, the church office, or you sit down with them in their living room, you should do your best to create a climate in which you'll be able to address the specific concerns without unnecessary emotional or physical tension and baggage attending you. Our Lord is a good example of this. In his interaction with the woman at the well, he sets her mind at rest so that meaningful interaction can engage by asking for a drink of water. Seek to create such a climate. Seeking to create such a climate depends in great measure upon the physical, psychological, and emotional and spiritual state of the person you are seeking to counsel and the nature of your relationship to that person. If they've just recently come into the church family, how you relate in trying to set a climate is different from one of the saints that you've witnessed the various periods of their lives, the birth of their children, their family developing and growing. You have a very deep, multi-leveled, intimate shepherd-sheep relationship. You can greet them with a warm embrace. You can be physically affectionate with them. All of these factors vary in any given situation, but the proximate goal when they show up at the study you show up at the home, is that you create as relaxed, as natural, compatible climate for meaningful interaction with this sheep or with these sheep. Singular, plural, both the same. But in setting that climate by God's grace and help, it's because you want to pursue this ultimate goal in your counseling session. And that ultimate goal must always be to see Christ more fully formed in those to whom we minister in this way. Remember the Colossians 1 and Galatians 4 text. As ministers of the gospel, our ultimate goal must never be mere behavior modification but evangelical transformation by the power of God's grace and the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Our goal is Paul's goal in Romans 12 and verse 2. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Evangelical transformation real substantive change in what John Owen at one time, and I was thrilled when I found this because I said, I'm not the only one that's wrestled with this. When the grace of God is operative in the heart and life of a believer, he actually changes things in the stuff of our spirits. And Owen even at one point said, he exerts a physical energy upon the soul. I said, yes, Lord, thank you. I'm not the only one that wrestled with it. He came up with a statement that just resonated with me. This is our goal. that something real, vital, substantive in the soul will occur as a result of our counsel. The second text that points in this direction is 2 Corinthians 3 and verse 18. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed. We're being metamorphosized into the same image from glory to glory, even as from the Lord the Spirit. There are many counselors who do not have this as their vision. They have what I call a suspension theology, that the Holy Spirit may, as it were, suspend an area 
of sinful influence, but the moment uh, the wrong thing is done or something, you plop back to where you were. And the concept of real transformation, real work upon the soul that will consummate in the final expression of that work when this present soul and spirit which animates me standing before you is going to be completely transformed into the moral likeness of Christ, every last vestige of sinful thought, desire, action, reaction, for every ever purged, and endowed with every Christ-like grace to the fullest capacity of the human spirit. Brethren, that's what God is aiming at, and that's what he's going to get. But he starts it when he breaks the dominion of sin in our initial union with Christ, and he carries it on in progressive sanctification, which is a matter something far transcending mere behavior modification. And this is why Paul, again, in Romans 8.13, can say, If you, by the Spirit, do put to death the deeds of the body, we are enabled to put things to death by the power and grace of the Spirit. And then Galatians 5.22 and 23 the Holy Spirit can actually create in us and bring forth from us as the fruit of his indwelling working that whole list of the ninefold fruit of the Spirit. So our goal, the proximate, create a climate for relaxed as much as possible, comfortable, meaningful, verbal interaction. The ultimate goal evangelical transformation. Now in the fifth place in this general overview, let me say a few words concerning a suggested method in addressing the subject. The model we will be following, borrowing its substance from some of the older writers, is that when we are engaged in pastoral counseling, we are functioning as physicians of souls. In the way in which I'll be teaching the material, we will trace out six steps following this model of physicians of souls. We'll have something to say about accepting the case. Secondly, setting the tone or introducing the session. Thirdly, diagnosis, making an attempt to discover what the real issues are. Then fourthly, the treatment prescribed. Five, follow up on the patient. Seek to monitor the results of our counsel, whether or not the patient is taking the medicine we've prescribed, whether the medicine is proving effective. And then finally, dismissal. Sometimes the dismissal from special, concentrated, individual pastoral care is done in great, triumphant, thankfulness to God. There's a sense in which an issue has come to such a definitive resolution and the opposite pattern established that we have reasonable grounds to be able to say, thank you, Lord, this sick sheep is now healthy in this area of the malady that brought us into the counseling session or sessions. Sometimes, It's dismissal when we reach an impasse and we'll deal with what those situations are. Other times, it may be dismissal to escalate the issue to a more formal, corrective church discipline. The bottom line is, when you've come to the place of dismissal, you are no longer engaged with that person in the special, individualized, pastoral interaction which has characterized your session or sessions with them. Let me say in summary, in our general overview of pastoral counseling, we've addressed the necessity for such ministry, the relative priority it should have in our labors, the setting in which we carry out this ministry, the goals we pursue in it, and a suggested method for approaching the subject. 
Now we move on to what is listed in your notes as unit number two, which is entitled The Presuppositional Framework for Pastoral Counseling. And in introducing this aspect of our study, I want to establish two very foundational issues. Number one, all counseling has a presuppositional framework. A presupposition is something you assume before to be true, whether rightly or wrongly, whether it's truth or a lie. Let me use as an example the presuppositions with which I stood before you at the beginning of this session. I was presupposing that you were all awake and eager to listen to me. I presuppose that. Secondly, I presuppose that you all spoke English as your primary linguistic framework of reference. And I presuppose that you all had the faculty of hearing. Three simple, basic presuppositions. Now, what would have happened if I invited a Frenchman who had proven competence in this field of study to bring this lecture this morning with a presupposition that you all spoke and understood French? Well, he'd be having a wonderful time blabbering on in his beautiful, mellifluous French language, but you wouldn't grasp but a word here or there. His presuppositions don't determine how you are able to respond to him. And because if the presuppositions are wrong, then something's going to go amiss in the communication. So when we sit with one of Christ's sheep, in order to minister to him on a personal basis, a whole set of presuppositions is present. Our understanding of the nature of man, the nature of reality, the basic issues of standards of right and wrong, the nature and reality of sin, God's grace, the ministry of the Holy Spirit, etc., etc., we bring a veritable carload of presuppositions to that counseling session. There is no such thing as presuppositionally neutral counseling any more than there is presuppositionally neutral education. Therefore, you and I must critically assess our own presuppositions and those of the one we are counseling to square both of them with the clear directives of such passages as Psalm 1. Would we know blessing in our counseling session? Blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of waters. Our presuppositions must be determined by and aligned with the scriptures. Romans 12 again. Don't let this world squeeze you into its mold. It is aggressively attempting to do it constantly. It is not content to have lost your mind to Christ. And it's continually seeking to pull it back under its dominating influence. And Paul says, don't let it do it. Assuming that we must consciously reject the presuppositional framework of the world that otherwise, because it was natively in us, and is continually seeking to regain ground in us, we must consciously resist it. Or Isaiah 20, to the law, to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light or dawning upon them. And then, of course, added to that, and we'll see what I mean by this, Paul's words in 1 Corinthians eleven fourteen. Doth not nature itself teach you? 
Some of our presuppositions will be rooted in general revelation. And all of God's revelatory data must be that which shapes our presuppositions, both and predominantly the presuppositions embedded in special revelation, but also those embedded in general revelation. Now, the second thing I want to assert in this introduction is that presuppositional framework of the pastor and the one he is counseling are constantly and powerfully active in the whole counseling process. Having sought to demonstrate there is no presuppositionally neutral counsel, I'm saying there is no suspended influence of the presuppositions. The presuppositions of both you as the pastor and the man or woman or couple you are constant, counseling are constantly and powerfully active in the whole counseling process. According to Matthew 12, 33 to 35, the things that come out of our mouths, as I emphasized yesterday, are an echo of the thoughts and the presuppositions of our hearts. At every step in the application of the physician of souls method and approach to pastoral counseling, this presuppositional framework is not only there latent, it is there active. It pulses and it breathes and insinuates its influence into the entire process, both for the pastor and for the one he is counseling. Now, I'm not saying that there is a heightened, present consciousness or intellectual awareness of these propositions at each moment in the session so that you're saying, excuse me, John, I want to see what presupp... Oh, yes, I got the presupposition. Now, John, this. Excuse me, John. I want no, I'm not saying that there is a present cognitive awareness, but I am saying that it is continually Operative, the presuppositions are there, shaping our thinking and our responses. As surely as you've been sitting here breathing since we started this session a half hour ago, but I doubt there's not a one of you who has consciously thought, I'm breathing, you've just been doing it. And when you stop doing it, we're calling 911. <laughs> Well, in the same way, we may not consciously think about our presuppositions, but those presuppositions are exerting their influence, giving shape and form both to processing what the person we are counseling is saying and shaping and processing what we say to them. When Jesus said, make the tree good and the fruit good, he was underscoring the fact that the good fruit of responsible biblical counsel can grow on the good tree of a presuppositional framework that is rooted in God's revelation. You cannot grow good counsel on the rotten tree of humanistic presuppositions. So by way of summary and transitioning into our next section Having addressed these two introductory concerns relative to the presuppositional framework of pastoral counseling, we'll now move forward and open up this unit under three major subdivisions. We'll consider the presuppositions as they exist in relationship to, number one, the counselor, that's you. And there will be three headings in opening up that line of thought, and then the counsel given, and there will be two major headings under that subject, and then thirdly, the one being counseled, and again, this will be treated under three headings. And what we will do in this hour, I'll simply go as far as I can go till we come up on the hour, and then we'll break off as close to a proper breaking point, having a captive audience 
not only the live audience, but those of you listening and watching the DVDs, I hope this will not cause any intellectual trauma if we make a break at a relatively awkward point. So then, we come now to the presuppositions as they relate to the Counselor himself. And as I've indicated, three subheadings, all of them beginning with the words, we must possess. And when I use the words must, I'm conscious that I'm touching conscience. And it's a dangerous, awesome responsibility to touch people's consciences. But I'm going after your conscience. I believe with all my heart that Scripture warrants these strong expressions of the presuppositions that you, as the Counselor, must possess. First one, we must possess a consciousness of our identity as overseers of the flock of God. One of the biblical truths that Dr. J. Adams has brought to the fore is the fact that though all mature Christians should come to some degree of being competent to counsel, and he's used Romans 15, 14 as his basic textual framework for that position. Whether or not J. Adams is pressed too much into that text or has squeezed more out of it than it warrants, that's a continuing debate. But the text means something to the ordinary believer at Rome that to some degree people filled with knowledge and goodness have some measure of competence to counsel others. If it doesn't mean that, the words are nonsense. So, though we may not align ourselves wholly with as much that Dr. Adams thinks he sees in the text, or whether we judge he's pushing more into it than God did, still every Christian who is mature and filled with the grace of goodness should have some measure of competence for an engagement in giving counsel. Now, without negating that strand of truth, we're addressing ourselves to that counseling that you will do as a duly recognized, biblically qualified under-shepherd laboring among the people of God. You are one of those described by Hebrews 13, 7, who has rule over them, and Hebrews 13, 17, one of those to whom the sheep are to submit in the Lord. And with a consciousness of this identity, two things should mark our interaction with our people when we are engaged in pastoral counseling with them. Number one, spiritual authority. Not carnal authoritarianism, but spiritual authority. And here I've given you a litany of texts it seems as though the apostle was particularly concerned to help Timothy and Titus, his younger colleagues in the ministry, especially Timothy, who from the various strands of biblical truth revealed about him, seemed to be of a more reticent, fearful, tentative temperament, along with his oft infirmities, for which Paul prescribed a little wine. That's Timothy. Now, as he engages in his work, notice how again and again Paul emphasizes that Timothy should have a consciousness of the spiritual authority that has been conferred upon him in his office. 1 Timothy 1 and verse 3. 1 Timothy 1 verse 3. As I exhorted you to tarry at Ephesus when I was going into Macedonia, that you might charge certain men not to teach a different doctrine, not that you might suggest or that you might imply, that you might charge, solemnly admonish, I charge you, Timothy, to charge certain men not to teach heterodoxy. And then in chapter 4, in verse 11, after giving a number of instructions to Timothy, he says, These things command 
and teach. Chapter 5 and verse 7. These things also command that they may be without reproach. Chapter 6 and verse 13. Again, I charge you in the sight of God who gives life to all things and of Christ Jesus who before Pontius Pilate witnessed the good confession, keep the commandment without spot, without reproach until the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And verse 17, charge them that are rich in this present world that they be not high-minded. Timothy, look out the fat cats in the congregation, lovingly, graciously sit them down and charge them. Not say, uh, excuse me, brethren, I'm sorry to mess around with your finances and your assets, but could it be that there's a possibility that God might want you sooner or later to recognize the stewardship of... No, no, he says sit them down and charge them. Talk to them straight. Exercise God-given spiritual authority. Titus 2 and verse 15. Similar emphasis to his younger colleague. These things, and he's been giving him very specific directives about different age groups and class groups within the church. These things speak and exhort and reprove with all authority, or as the margin has it, with all commandment. Then he says, let no man despise you. Let no man treat you with lightness or carelessness because you take that role of an authoritative declarer of the mind and will of God. If your call to the office of an under-shepherd is legitimate, then you have been given authority by Christ to shepherd, to rule, and to govern in his church. Acts 20, 28. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you. Granted, you're to rule and govern by the special authority of your office. Therefore, you are called to counsel your people with something more than a Rogerian grunt to indicate you've begun to understand and sympathize with their problem. Uh, tell me some more, John. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You're called to more than a humanistic notion that you're merely a catalyst to help people discover their own answers to their own problems, that they may leave the study patting themselves on the back that they discovered what their problem was. When the scripture says you are to teach and preach with all authority, that does not necessarily mean that you do so with the same thunder and intensity and lightning with which you might teach and preach those things from the pulpit. The manner will be determined by the circumstances, but not the matter. You are still a minister of the Word of God, bringing that Word with Christ-given spiritual authority. And you must have that presupposition deeply embedded in your own soul if you're to be a true biblical pastoral counselor. Let's move then to the second thing that should mark our counsel, and I'm describing it as the spirit of Christ-like servanthood. And I take that wording from such passages as Matthew 20, 25 to 28, well known to us, where Jesus contrasts leadership in his church from leadership in the world and puts forward himself as the example, I am among you as he that serves. 2 Corinthians 4, 5, we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus is Lord and ourselves your servants for Christ's sake. And then the very strong language of 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 19, where Paul asserts, Though I am free from all, no man can come and point his finger and lord it over me, intruding upon my conscience where God does not. Though I was free from all men, 
I brought myself under bondage. Literally, I made myself the slave of all that I might gain the more. And then Ephesians 5.29. How does Christ care for his church? He nurtures and cherishes his church. And we are called as his under shepherds and as his representatives to do the same. Paul can say to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 12, 15, he said, I am ready to spend and be spent out for you, though the more I love you, the less I be loved. This is to be the disposition Again, underscored in 1 Thessalonians 2, 7 and 8, Paul uses the imagery of a nursing mother who is nursing her own child. We were gentle among you as a nursing mother with her own child. And then I was with you as an assertive, loving father, admonishing and teaching every one of you as a father with his children. So, with respect to the presuppositions as they relate to ourselves, I assert, first of all, we must possess a consciousness of our identity as overseers of the flock. And that consciousness should be marked by an awareness of our spiritual authority, but a disposition of Christ-like servanthood to the one sitting before us. Brethren, I'm sure you would say amen to this. Few things are more demanding upon the entirety of our redeemed humanity than empathetic, discerning, yet confrontational pastoral counseling. We are there, one in one, with a distressed, needy sheep crying for help, or we're sitting before a stubborn, recalcitrant sheep acting more like a goat at the time of our council than acting like a sheep, or like Calvin said, they're acting like a bear. They're not welcoming us and the exercise of our authority in seeking to guide them. And in that situation, there's none of the exhilaration that comes when we stand facing a sea of eager faces on the Lord's day. People who've come hungry to hear the word of God from our lips. And in that marvelous, mystical, but real presence of Christ by the Spirit, there's that exhilaration. The people are giving to you and you're giving to them and that there's giving back and forth, and God is giving His Spirit, and there's that beautiful triangular spiritual dynamics of preaching in the power of the Spirit. You don't have all that. You're sitting there. She's there. You're here. He's there. You're here. And you don't have that supportive spiritual context. You've prayed for the presence of God and for the enablement of the Spirit But the operations and the awareness of God answering that prayer have different dimensions than those experienced in the gathered church. But then secondly, as our presuppositions regarding ourselves, we must possess a consciousness of our identity as men who are still sinners. Let me enlarge on that in two directions. Number one, we must maintain the consciousness that we are but men, the consciousness of our humanity. When we do, this will keep us from seeking to act as though we are omniscient or omnipotent to help others. Some counseling sessions lead primarily to a fresh baptism of frustration because we're simply men. We feel at the end of it, we've really not got our finger on the real problem. Frustration. We feel at the end of it, if only God would give us omniscience for 30 seconds, we'd be able to see what the real issue is. And then there are times when we feel so utterly helpless, where the situation seems helpless and hopeless, and we wish we had an arm of omnipotence to stretch forth for just a few seconds 
But we're not. We're mere creatures of the dust. And God tells us again and again, cease from man whose breath is in his nostrils. If we consciously have as the presupposition concerning ourselves, we are but men. It will keep us from acting as though we are omniscient or omnipotent. Further, it will help us to remember we are not lords over the consciences of others. Many people are desperate when they come to a counseling session to have an authoritative guru. We are not gurus who have the final word. In biblical language, we must always remember that the treasure of gospel ministry publicly and privately is always contained in an earthen vessel, in clay pots. That's what I am, a clay pot. And God says, if I forget that and I trust in myself, then his curse is upon me. Jeremiah 17, 5 and following. Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his arm. John 15, 5. Without me, apart from me, severed from me, ceasing to draw your life and strength from me, you can do nothing. So, brethren, it possess, if we possess this consciousness of our identity as men, this will help us greatly to engage in the counseling session in a way that is honoring to God. But we are not only men, we are also still sinners. So we must maintain a consciousness that we are still sinners. It's evident from the reading of the Apostle Paul that he never forgot what he once had been and what he yet knows himself to be apart from the grace of God. 1 Timothy 1, 12 to 16, Paul there lets us know, I never can forget what I once was. A murderer, a blasphemer, one whom God has made a theater to display that indeed, when I tell you this is a faithful saying, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. He grabbed the chief one when he grabbed me, and he never forgot it. And he never forgot what he still was, apart from the grace of God. I am what I am, present tense, by the grace of God. And then Titus 3, 3 to 6, we ourselves were one time foolish, disobedient, serving diverse lust and pleasures. What effect will that presupposition living in our hearts have on our counseling? Well, two things. One of them is highlighted in Hebrews 5, 1 and 2. Hebrews 5, 1 and 2, where... The writer to the Hebrews is demonstrating why our high priest had to be a man. And we read in Hebrews 5, verses 1 and 2, the following. For every high priest being taken from among men is appointed for men in things pertaining to God that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins, who can bear gently with the ignorant and erring for that he himself is compassed with infirmity. And the priest could be empathetic and sympathetic with the sinning Israelite who comes with his sacrifice because he knows he had to offer his own sacrifice, before he could be the recipient of the offering of the coming Israelite. And brethren, when we have this awareness, we are yet sinners, what we were before God laid hold of us and what we yet are and can from our hearts still say the words of Romans 7, periodically in our experience, wretched man that I am. It's going to make all the difference in the world the way 
we listen to and enter in the struggles of our people. We will never think for a moment, how could he or she ever do that? Rather, we will sit there and say, Lord, but for your grace, I would be telling some preacher what this person is telling me. And that will give a tone and a flavor which a discerning Christian will pick up from you. They will pick up what your instinctive internal reaction will be. It may register in the look of the eyes. It may register in some other way. But when people sense that we genuinely feel the reality of who and what we were and what we yet are, it then creates the climate where they will feel confident that they can bear their hearts and at times tell their sordid story and we will not reject them. I found a little device I've used when I knew or had reason to suspect one or the other or both that someone was coming for a counseling session because of some grievous sin. Before we even pray, I will say to them, now my brother, I have reason to believe you're here to share some things of which you are deeply ashamed, but I don't want you to have any reluctance thinking that I'm going to look down my nose at you, I'm going to throw stones at you, but for the grace of God, there's no sin you've been involved in that either I have in my past been involved in, or should God take his hand off me for a day, I could yet be involved in it. And I trust you feel confident to open your heart with transparency and with honesty. It's that presupposition about who we are that will convey the disposition that will enable them to open their hearts to us. Now, we've used up our hour and we will break off right here and pick up in the next hour on this third presupposition that we as the counselors ought to have in our dealings with our people. Let's pray and then ask God's blessing upon our time together over the lunch tables. Father, how thankful we are that we have your word to cut through all of the nonsense and the morass of muddy thinking relative to this matter of pastoral counseling. And we pray that your word will continue to shape our minds and our thoughts about ourselves and then about the counsel we give and about those to whom we give that counsel. Continue to direct us, lead us in a plain path. Bless our endeavors to know how better to serve our Lord Jesus and to serve our people as their servants for Christ's sake. Bless now our time about the lunch table. We thank you for every provision you have made for all of our needs. Accept our thanks and sanctify our conversation and interaction. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.